over to you madam yeah thank you good evening all the delegates uh today we are presenting a very interesting topic on chronic pain and pregnancy from the society of post study of pain pune in association with bharti hospital uh to start with i request swami madam president sspp to welcome all the speakers and delegates over to you swami madam good evening all i think i, I am audible i am audible Rishali. yes yes you are audible yeah good evening all as you know from last year we have been conducting regular successful academic meets from our society of study of pain in pune i want to thank each and every one for this enthusiastic participation in this academic meet on behalf of our society of pain clinic society and pain clinic of department of anesthesiology bharti hospital pune i welcome all delegates speakers and guest speakers for today's interesting topic we have eminent speakers with us dr girija wag madam from professor obgy bharti hospital swati bisay madam hod physiotherapy bharti hospital and our own pain physicians dr uttam and dr kenya our guest speaker is dr sukanya mitra from government medical college chandigarh i welcome you all once again uh, for this interesting academic meet i hope you all delegates will enjoy this meet definitely without taking more time i will hand over to shweta thank you over to you shweta you are muted shweta yes uh, good evening all as we know we are here for the chronic pain and pregnancy topic so uh, we know that in uh, many women physiological changes of pregnancy can be associated with increased pain and physical discomfort so however women who have this pain problem before pregnancy they have exaggerated pain response during pregnancy as a result pregnancy becomes a very difficult period of life in uh, for those women so with this i invite our first speaker for tonight dr vitirija wag madam Uh, who will put more light on this topic that's prevalence of chronic pain in pregnancy good evening uh, can i share my slides ma'am i'll introduce you in okay okay do that yeah <laughs> <laughs> can i have a... can you see the Yeah, wait, Veta. Yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. Let them yeah. display the slide. Yeah. Sure. Meanwhile, I'll just request all the speakers to stick to the time. That's ten to twelve minutes per topic, and uh, we'll discuss all the questions uh, at the end of the webinar. I think Kirija Madam will not need any introduction. She is. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> They are taking away one. No, I love. <laughs> yes, yes. You She is a professor. Slide. If you have slide. Yeah, I have. I have. I was waiting for the technical team to display, but uh, okay. Uh, Kirija Wag Madam is a professor, Shri, department of Anes- yeah, yeah, department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Bharti Hospital, Pune. She is a senior consultant at Cloud Nine and Apollo Hospital, Pune. Uh, she is vice president indian chapter registrar since 2014 assistant coordinator national eclampsia registry enough, enough. since 2018 enough, enough, enough. Yeah. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> welcome i am an ma'am. obstetrician i am an obstetrician who looks after women's health bus that's it okay you, so i'll just share my slides <laughs> and we will i'll take you through the next 10 minutes as promised shweta i won't go beyond that and the task that has been given so very thankfully to me is prevalence of chronic pain in pregnancy and uh, thank you so much especially dr varshali for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity 
and thanks dr sarita swami who is the president of sspp varsha li secretary and joy shankar jana my very very dear friend and it's nice to see you here on the screen likewise dr uttam sidaye with whom i'm going to share the screen i'm very very it's really a wonderful time for me today this evening to meet every one of you shweta and swati bhi se so as we all know that pregnant women with chronic pain present a unique clinical challenge for both the chronic pain and obstetrical providers and the challenge further increases by the fact that there are no clinical guidelines to get, you know help us and women are more impacted by chronic pain disorders than men and usually doctors frequently faced with difficulties of managing chronic pain conditions that were present prior to during or after pregnancy usually turn off these patients you know to somebody and the brand is always taken by an obstetrician and the pain thresholds in healthy women without chronic pain have been shown to increase throughout pregnancy peaking just prior to delivery and it is unclear how these findings may translate to women with chronic pain as such individuals often have hyper analgesia allodynia and or decreased pain thresholds at baseline Now, the commonest thing that women would complain to would be back pain and in the current era of quick testing the moment they do your pregnancy test even when they are 4 weeks pregnant they will start having back ache and this is a frequent ailment that we encounter in pregnancy and surprisingly enough we do not have any solution to this ailment because our own geeta of obstetrics the williams obstetrics says that there is limited research and therefore we are left to ourselves and there is no proper training given to especially us as obstetricians about the pain and the explanation that we give to the patient is that it has to be a lifestyle and maybe it's because of the progesterone related laxity now typically if you look at the epidemiology or history of lower back pain doubles the risk of developing pre pregnancy related low back pain pregnancy related pain typically starts between 5th and 7th month 40% of women who experience pregnancy related back ache continue to suffer 6 months after delivery and 20% report pain 3 years later almost 75% of women undergoing chiropractic manipulations report significant pain reduction and clinically significant improvements in visibility so we understand that it is a common occurrence and 70 nearly 72% of women suffer from it and typically it would be a lumbar pain pelvic pain or a combination of both with a few studies investigating differences between this type and hip and foot pain are also common during the perinatal period now the factors which are found associated with low back ache are usually age the race or presence of low back pain before pregnancy during menstruation and during a previous pregnancy and the factors which are not associated are the ethnicity that especially the hispanic ethnicity use of oral contraceptives caffeine tobacco exercise pre pregnancy body weight parity and history of infertility with hormone therapy are not associated with an increased risk now postural changes can be contributory and this can be physiological as we know that as the pregnancy advances the posture automatically changes with an exaggerated lumbar lordosis while it can be acquired because many times out of anxiety women tend to take an abnormal posture and where would be the pain it could be upper back ache there could be a lower back ache or there can also be a pelvic girdle pain and typically uh, you would have a uh, you know it would start from the neck to the sometimes numbness in the extremities to sciatica low back ache leg pain pubic pain hyper extension would give rise to heel foot pain accentuated curvature and rib pain difficulty in breathing all these pains are known to be commonly associated and there are various i'm sure the physiotherapist is going to speak about all these in much detail so i'll not take this slide here what is very important is sometimes you may not understand this pain properly it can be because of a herniated or a bulging disc also because of the current extreme lethargic lifestyle many times women have so much weaknesses in their back that they are at risk of developing such kind of a thing which can cause a sciatica kind of a pain therefore in pregnancy there can be everything from headaches to thoracic outlet syndrome muscle pains intercostal neuralgia costovertebral pain coccydynia very common pain that will will be coming up lower back ache and symphysis pubis dysfunction and also the round ligament syndrome 
Now, this round ligament syndrome is one of the another cause of pain in the later part of pregnancy where the round ligaments get stretched. And typically, they will say that I am having pain somewhere going, reflecting to the pubic symphysis. Now, this is something which can be explained to them and guided to them by using proper corsets against because that can help in protecting the round ligament. Now, quickly coming to pregnancy and chronic pain. Now, usually, this is a big factor because pain management teams and clinics often tell the patients to go to the obstetrician and they say, now that you are pregnant, we cannot deal with it. And this can be because of lack of evidence-based approach. And therefore, women during pregnancy especially would land up receiving suboptimal care. And if you look at the overall prevalence of pregnant women with pre-existing chronic pain disorders, it's unknown. Likewise, the general course of chronic pain conditions during pregnancy has not been studied. Pre-existing pain disorders have a negative impact on pregnancy and are associated with increased you know, sick leave, insomnia, depressive symptoms during pregnancy. Headaches are one such kind of pain. 16 to 18% of women of reproductive age, but the prevalence during pregnancy is unknown. Course of headache during pregnancy is variable. Migraines largely improve or remit during pregnancy in about 1.3% of women, while postpartum period in 4.5% of women, probably they are distracted now towards the baby. And there is an associated greater risk of preterm deliveries, gestational hypertension, and preeclampsia if women have a tendency of having migraines. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder, as we understand. And it is known to have an improvised course during pregnancy. However, it does cause a lot of challenges for us as obstetricians because of its autoimmune kind of a pathogenesis. We have various kinds of things associated. Sometimes these women are on very high NSAIDs and then we have to modify them during pregnancy. The immunological challenges may give rise to consequences of abnormal obstetric outcomes. And therefore, there can be a, some sort of a sustained fetal tolerance throughout healthy pregnancy, or sometimes there can be a fractured fetal tolerance, which can cause complications throughout pregnancy. So rheumatoid arthritis is one such example of a chronic pain condition, which would be prevalent throughout and would want us to look at. Another challenge is anemia, especially sickle cell disease, because it does cause a lot of vasoocclusive pain and sickle cell crisis. And many a times still now, we do practice in better settings, screening all women for thalassemia and sickle cell disorder. But many a times this may be missed. So whenever a patient is coming to you with anemia, pain, I think we should look at all these conditions also, and they can be responsible. Likewise, the ehlers danlos syndrome, which is actually a connective tissue disorder, which is heritable and which causes hypermobility of joints and skin. And for us as obstetricians, it would be that thing which we look for if the woman is having early preterm births or you know, cervical insufficiency or she lands up in postpartum hemorrhage. Now, these people, because of excessive laxity during pregnancy, can have a lot of pain. So when you look at pain in total, and if you look at pre-pregnancy, intra-pregnancy, post-pregnancy, all these things mandate a lot of lifestyle change understanding, empathy, and compassion, and that would help them. Evidence lacks a lot, and therefore I would like to congratulate the organizers of this organization for bringing up this point in a big way, and hope is definitely there for around the corner, and therefore I look forward to better approach to pain. As we all know, there is an enormous amount of options that a physician can provide today, right down from curing patients, treating patients, or providing with psychic solace or pain relief. So in fact, the gamut of medical intervention is enormous. And I quote Siddharth Mukherjee while I'm saying this. And living with chronic pain is hard, but dealing with those who don't care or understand is harder. And therefore, friends, we all are doctors. I would really, really want you to look at all your patients empathetically when they come to you with pain, not saying that they are malingering, that is just because you are pregnant, just because you delivered, just because you are taking reproduction medicines or you're menstruating, there may be more to it. And that is where we all should stand. And therefore look at from their eyes and how difficult they must be finding if we don't pay attention to their pain needs. So with this, I thank you for your kindness. And I would like to say this quote about gratitude, that love and kindness are never wasted. 
they always make a difference and they bless the one who receives them and they bless you, the giver, says Barbara De Angelis. And I think as physicians, we should always be there giving best to our patients. Thank you so much for giving me that time. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a wonderful talk and letting us know the obstetrician point of view behind this handling these pregnant females with pain. So now we'll move ahead. As we are aware that inadequately managed persistent pain can result in anxiety, depression, and uh, these all things can impact uh, on the woman's physical, psychological well-being. And they can have uh, adverse effect on pregnancy. So it is our responsibility as pain physicians to manage this pain, especially for women during pregnancy, uh, so that they should not feel that pain during pregnancy as well as lactation. So our next topic is uh, management of chronic pain in pregnancy. It's my pleasure to invite our guest speaker, Dr. Sukanna Mitra, ma'am. Uh, Vivek, sir, please. She is a professor of anesthesia and department of anesthesia intensive care in Government Medical College and Hospital Chandigarh. Uh, she has to... see CV. Yeah, uh, it's been shared. No, uh, open, open the CV and minimize it. Vivek, Shweta, just a minute. I'll try. Okay. It's visible, Shweta. You can go ahead. Uh, Madam has total of the 106 publications, which include 16 books, book chapters, 40 articles in national journals, and 50 articles in international journals. She has been peer reviewer for index journals like Acta Anesthesia, Logica, Scandinavica, Journal of Clinical Anesthesia, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. She has received multiple awards and grants for national and international forums. And she's a recipient of Dr. Rukmini Pandit Award in 2001. Also, she has uh, received COPS Award in Practitioners Forum uh, in 2003. Madam, please enlighten us with your take on management of chronic pain in pregnancy. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. OK. Um... So I am sharing my screen and while I'm doing that, um, it's wonderful to speak to the uh, pain physicians from Pune and, and I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this meeting. Uh, so uh, my previous speaker has made my task um, pretty easy and I'm going to skip some of the things that she has already mentioned. So um, I'm basically going to talk about the management of uh, chronic pain in pregnant patients. So pain during pregnancy can be due to injury. It can be due to pre-existing painful condition. Uh, it could be due to associated with headache, breast pain, low back pain, pelvic and abdominal pain, and of course the lower limb pain, et cetera. Now, um, why do we talk about chronic pain and pregnancy? My previous speaker has already mentioned, the, but uh, it does cause a, a, a considerable amount of burden. And uh, this leads to anxiety and depression, uh, insomnia, hypertension, now poor quality of life, and decreased bonding between the mother and the baby. Uh, so what are the, uh, then when we come to the management of chronic pain, so let us look at our practice goals. Uh, we should have strategies to uh, include um, or avoid or minimize use of opioids for pain management, um, highlight the importance of non mm -hmm. therapies. Like Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, sorry to disturb. Uh, can you please adjust your camera so that we can see your face? Oh, okay. Is it? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, chronic pain can, uh, so with this, that uh, um, uh, chronic pain can be challenging to manage the non obstetric population. 
and because they can lead to a plethora of you know teratogenic effect miscarriage etc so safety issues need to be judiciously balanced with the efficacy issues which is really uh, not an easy task um now when we talk about the chronic pain patients uh, management uh, so there are certain barriers that's why we cannot uh, have the chronic uh, manage this uh, very effectively so one is first is uh, patient related that in uh, they do not report pain and um, they avoid taking analgesics now physician related is very important there is an inadequate training and guidelines to manage pregnancy sorry hello yeah madam uh, please adjust your camera uh, you are still not visible yeah please yeah thank you so much yeah. ma'am have you shared your screen can you see the screen hello Not yet, ma'am. Not, not yet. No, not, not yet. yet. You have to screen your share your screen, ma'am. Uh, okay, let me see. Sorry about that. Um, just a second. Hmm. I think I did share my screen. Um, are you able to see now? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. madam may i suggest you on your screen you will see that share screen green icon have yeah. you clicked that before opening up ppt yeah i did okay then it's not visible then maybe you have to uh, minimize it and share it again uh, once again you can try ma'am it's just like is it a ma'am or vivek if you have you can share no no ma'am has not sent to okay Ma'am, if you can send me, I can share it. Yes, it's visible. Visible. Yes, it's visible. you can continue ma'am it's visible now so uh, as i've mentioned that um, uh, we should uh, stay stress on uh, the non um, uh, like opioid management and uh, physiological physical therapy and uh, opioid therapy should form the third line of management and if at all opioids have to be given they should be appropriately indicated we should discuss the risk with the patient and use the lowest possible um, uh, dose that uh, that is available and multimodal analgesia of course takes up um, uh, prevalence in this management now uh, coming evaluating a patient of uh, chronic uh, pain in pregnancy same as that of um, uh, any other chronic pain except that menstrual history needs to be taken Na and history taking is similar. Physical examination is also similar. And um, but what is important is that one must uh, try to rule out depression and anxiety. And neurological examination for sensory, motor, and uh, tendon reflexes needs to be done. Now assessment is again also the similar. I'm not uh, repeating them. so let us look what is our management goal in uh, chronic pain uh, in pregnant patients so uh, we need to monitor the patient for alcohol and substance abuse collaborate with the patient to set the treatment goals and develop a management strategy both for labor as well as delivery 
Now, um, multidisciplinary management is always the cornerstone of um, any chronic pain patient. And um, uh, obviously, non-pharmacological methods, which are going to be discussed later in details, like CBT, relaxation technique, hypnosis, physical therapy, etc., are to be encouraged in the beginning. And now, uh, with this, I come to the management of specific pain during pregnancy. I'm going to talk about certain painful conditions, and my previous speaker has mentioned some more. So uh, let us see chronic pain during pregnancy could be pregnancy related, that is low back pain and pelvic girdle pain, and non-pregnancy related like headache, migraine, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, low back pain, etc. Now, uh, low back pain, my previous speaker has already mentioned, more than 70% affected, and they are due to multifactorial, due to hormonal, um, uh, skin during pregnancy, and of course, for lumbar lordosis accentuates this. Now, um, coming to the management, like broadly, it has four headings. First is the patient education. We should ask the patient to avoid maladaptive movements. Non-pharmacological um, uh, uh, methods should be stressed. Pharmacological um, non-opioids should be stressed. And last but not the least, some patients need intervention which is going to be discussed in detail in subsequent talk. Now coming to headache, like we must need to find out what kind of headache it is. Like is it a migraine, tension type or both? And uh, one can manage it like either ac uh, management could be acute or it could be uh, preventive. Now for preventive management, TCS, magnesium and botulinum toxins can be useful. For acute management, um, uh, the, I've already been mentioning a non-pharmacological and certain non-opioid drugs can be used. One word about the triptans. They can usually triptan use in pregnancies not associated with major congenital malformation, but use in second and third trimester can lead to PPH. Now coming to the next common one that is rheumatoid arthritis. Again, uh, talking about management, like it has been seen that the use of DMRD and NSAIDs decline and use of glucocorticoid in these patients are quite um, increased. However, prednisolone when used more than 20 milligram per kg per day can lead to certain uh, uh, developmental problems. Now, uh, the another one is the carpal tunnel syndrome. This is quite prevalent, up to 35% of the patients, and, um, and usually supportive management, and extreme cases, surgical decompression might be required. Varicose vein is also another uh, common condition causing pain in pregnancy, and this is due to increased blood volume and pressure from gravid uterus. And again, the conservative therapy is encouraged. So basically, one should take a cautious approach to prescribing opioids. But what is worth mentioning is that pregnancy should not be a reason to avoid treating acute pain because of concern for opioid abuse or neonatal abstinence syndrome. Finally, when I talk about management or giving an overview of management of uh, chronic pain during pregnancy, I need to see some practical points. And uh, the, uh, it is important to distinguish between a patient with pain without opioid tolerance who will need increased analgesics. So patient, on the contrary, a patient who is opioid tolerant or on medication assisted treatment like buprenorphine or methadone will benefit more from regional blocks rather than additional opioid therapy. So um, then as we say that what should be the plan for labor analgesia? Well, use of combined spinal epidural or dural puncture epidural for a parturient with chronic pain is recommended. Now, uh, DPE allows uh, distribution and increased absorption of medication from CSF, and neuraxial adjuncts can be also useful. 
Now, uh, my previous speaker has already mentioned about the DD of pain during labor. And uh, what is important is that these helps in determination and management. Now, um, when if the pain is above the pelvis, it is uh, 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 from the it is um, uh, due to the pregnancy related pain, uh, labor pain, low back pain could be because of back pain, lumbar uh, sacral plexus uh, pressure, etc. And lower pelvic pain can be because of either fetal head engagement or pelvic girdle pain, etc. Now, how to consider this? Manage, uh, increase the volume of epidural solution. One may also consider concentration of local anesthetic or opioid and add adjuncts like clonidine or dexmedetinidine. Uh, worth mentioning that dexim causes um, more sedation as compared to sufentanil. Epinephrine in epidural solution has also been used for troubleshooting. Now, um, some questions about uh, uh, that comes uh, in a day-to-day -day practice. When neuraxial analgesia remains insufficient, then what should we do? Now, add inhaled nitrous oxide uh, or entonox, use remifentanil PCL, and um, start low-dose dexmedetomidine intravenous infusion. Well, these are available in our country. Now, intraoperative cesarean section discomfort and patient is very anxious. So what to do? We can keep low dose propofol infusion, but we should keep the patient audibly conversing. Now then um, what to do in this kind of patients who are undergoing cesarean delivery and having some problem. Now patients who are in chronic pain or having substance use disorder, if the patient con continues to complain of sufficient, insufficient analgesia, well, obstetrician uh, needs to be informed that they preferably uh, the uterus should not be exteriorized. Neuraxial opioid dosing may be increased and uh, maybe clonidine 50 to 100 microgram intrathecal can be given in these patients. So I have already told you that combined spinal epidural needs to be done in these patients. Now patients with chronic pain and um, opioid tolerance may require an increase in the dose of neuraxial morphine and epidural catheter and repeated morphine for epidural morphine for uh, um, post-operative pain management. Now, methadone may also be used for management of post-operative patients in such, uh, such patients. Now, sometimes these patients, you know, refuse uh, regional so they undergo general anesthesia. In such cases, bilateral tap lock and quadratus lumborum block can be useful. Um, and um, of course, for ERAS, again, multimodal analgesic op uh, options are useful. Now, uh, I have already mentioned about this, important to distinguish a patient with chronic pain without opioid tolerance who will need more analgesics and patients who are opioid tolerant and will benefit more from regional blocks. And these two needs to be kept in mind. Now, um, also splitting the dose of once a day methadone or buprenorphine to twice or thrice a day are useful. Now, this is just a table which shows that chronic pain, non-opioid tolerant, not on medication assisted treatment. So what to do for labor analgesia? Combined spinal epidural with very low dose of intrathecal bupivacaine or fentanyl. And caesarean delivery, uh, one can use a uh, combined spinal epidural in higher uh, dose of bupivacaine. And uh, they can be also used epidural catheter for breakthrough pain with uh, adjuncts. Now, chronic pain who, in patients who are opioid tolerance and are uh, medically medical assisted uh, treatment. For them, the recommended mode for labor analgesia is dural puncture epidural. This is a new mode that has come here. And uh, combined uh, spinal epidural can also be used for cesarean section. Now I have come to the end of my lecture. I'm sorry for overshooting the time, but uh, chronic uh, pain management in pregnant patients is a serious concern 
and one needs to judiciously balance the pain control versus the safety issues of both mother and the baby. I thank you all for the attention and I apologize for overshooting the time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for your valuable input. Actually, this topic is very big to adjust in so less time. But thank you so much. And uh, definitely, when we talk about pain management, uh, now, uh, we'll, first line of management is always conservative before going to intervention. So we must know the pharmacology for the conservative management of pain. And that's our next topic. So I would like to invite our next speaker, our very own Dr. Vashali Kinya, ma'am. Uh, she is a professor, a pain palliative care physician in Department of Anesthesiology, Bharti Vidya Pit uh, University and Hospital. She is also secretary of SSPP Pune. Uh, she has 20 plus years of uh, experience in field of anesthesia with special interest in regional anesthesia. She has been mentor and is mentor and course coordinator uh, for chronic pain fellowship in BVDUMC Pune. She has uh, always been instrumental in starting acute pain services at Bharti Hospital. Uh, she has been faculty for many ultrasound guided block workshops and conferences. And uh, she has publications, uh, nine in reputed journal, a chapter in a book, Pain and Palliative Care. So over to you, ma'am. Please tell us about pharmacology of chronic pain in pregnancy. Thank you, Shweta, for your kind words. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to request all the participants, if they have any questions, they can put it in chat box. So at the end of the session, we can discuss. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Yeah, at the, uh, good evening all. At the outset, let me uh, appreciate uh, the earlier speaker, Vak Madam and Sukanya Madam for their excellent talk and great insights into the prevalence and uh, chronic treatment of the chronic pain conditions in pregnancy. Now moving to pharmacology. Yeah, we all know so far that almost 80 to 85% of patients do take some kind of medications in their pregnancy. And out of that, 50% could be painkillers or analgesics. So they might or might not have pain. The pregnancy it may, itself may cause pain or the patient may present with exaggeration of pain. Chronic pain may have adverse effects on physical and mental health and medication during pregnancy ad poses added risk to the pregnant woman. So physicians and pregnant women are always in a dilemma of stopping the medication or reducing the medication so as to increase the ongoing pain or should we continue with the same dosages? So they are always in a fighting mood with each other. I mean, whether to start, whether to stop, decrease or continue. So it's always a challenging for women as well as the pregnant woman as well as the physician. Second, the discovery and development of all the new drugs be it analgesic, are always supported by various randomized control studies, but they definitely lack in when it comes to a pregnant lady. So there is always a scarcity of resources and clear-cut guidelines. Added to this, there is altered pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in pregnancy, which adds to the confusion. And one must not uh, forget the pharmacogenomics, which is variations in the nucleotide polymorphism which in turn can lead to altered metabolism of the drugs. The very good example for this is codeine, which is metabolized by cytochrome. The duplication of this hormone may lead to increased production of its byproduct morphine, which may be detrimental to the neonate or fetus. Also, while considering the pharmacology, we must keep in mind that different organs in their intrauterine uh, intra growth, they have different susceptibility to teratogenicity. For example, the heart is most sensitive during the first four weeks of pregnancy, whereas the external genitalia are more sensitive to the teratogenic effect of any drugs between eight and ninth months. 
and the brain and skeleton are sensitive from beginning to the end and they continue to be more developed in the postnatal period also so these things are to be kept into mind when one considers the pharmacology of or the treatment part analgesic treatment of any pregnant woman so while considering the pharmacology one must not forget the important aspect of counseling in terms of almost all the pregnant to almost all the pregnant women who are any on any kinds of drug that they might have chances of birth defect to almost 3% or 15% of mis they might suffer from miscarriage so when before starting any pharmacology the pregnant lady and the physician should be clear on this and on the equal terms as said the drug effect might have uh, the the drug effect on the fetus occurs at three stages within first 3 to 4 weeks it's a germinal period where the drug produces either all or none effect so either the embryo survives uh, the effect of the drug or it just uh, gets aborted so it's all or none effect the second period is embryonic period in it is the most crucial period and it is between 4 weeks to almost uh, 12 to 14 weeks where the most teratogenic effect of the all the drugs are uh, precipitated so we need to remember these two effects very clearly uh, before uh, 31st day or within 4 weeks and then 4 to 12 weeks now the usa fda regulations initially had formulated the labeling techniques for pregnancy and lactation into five categories this was implemented in 1994 and it was continued uh, till almost few years back till 2014 in this they had categorized the drugs into four categories category a b c and d and category x the category a is where the adequate studies in pregnant women have not shown any uh, adverse effect so the drugs are classified in this category the most common example is multivitamin category b is where the animal studies have not shown any effects but there are no adequate studies or clinical trials in pregnant women category c belongs to animal studies where they have the drugs had adverse effect but there are no adequate clinical studies in pregnant women but the drug can be continued if it the benefits overweighs the risk and then the category d where there are no studies either in animal or human beings but evidence shows that there is risk to the fetus but potential benefit benefits outweighs the risk and where the drug can be used for the pregnant lady category, category x belongs to those where the animal studies as well as the human studies shows fetal abnormalities and as far as possible they are contraindicated or or are to be avoided after 2014 the pregnancy and lactation labeling rule came into account which was implemented in 2020 july 2020 here they have added one more group to the uh, labeling system female and male reproductive personnel the in the child bearing age so this is the dedicated section labeling uh, for the drugs of child uh, for the patients of child bearing age but it clearly pro provides detailed information for both patients and healthcare providers about the uh, various effect of the drugs so now with this we let's consider individual drugs in short to start with acetaminophen the favorite drug of all crocin it is said to be most safe drug throughout the pregnancy from start to end but not to be taken or continued for more than 4 months and the dose should not be exceed 4 grams per day though it has very less chances of developing a cryptorchidism in first few weeks of pregnancy but definitely a safer drug and to be preferred drug throughout the pregnancy the second one is aspirin or acetosalicylic acid uh what literature mentions that low dose aspirin is, uh, aspirin is safer in uh, in uh, first trimester as well as second trimester but again the risk of uh, cryptorchidism which is common to all nsaids should be kept in mind and towards the end of the third trimester and uh, postnatal even has to remember that all the nsaids they have the tendency to because they are cox2 inhibitors they have tendency to uh, effect to have a effect on premature closure of ductus arteriosus and 
then uh, in turn developing uh, pulmonary hypertension of the pneumon. So these two effects are common for an NSAIDs, more or less similar to all. So the, uh, to be kept in mind towards the end of the pregnancy. Apart from this, the aspirin is known to have a clotting abnormalities and uh, one has to remember that it can cause inhibition of neonatal platelets up to five days after so delivery. Indomethacin is said to be a short-term insu insurance drug because it, is, it can be given uh, with guarded uh, or safely during the first two trimesters. But similarly, at towards the end of the trimester, uh, end of the third trimester, you need to be careful because of it's the said uh, known effect like pulmonary hypertension and uh, ductal constriction. One thing about endomethacin, I would like to mention that it has a reversible inhibition. So this advantage we can take to stop the endomethacin just two weeks prior to the said uh, expected date of delivery. So the effect of endomethacin can be prevented. So one, if the patient is on endomethacin, it is advisable to, pay, to start the patient on tocolytics. Coming to ibuprofen, Ketrolac, and uh, the other two drugs like naproxen and silicoxib, the similar guidelines are advisable to avoid in first and second trimester, and then to keep in mind about the premature closure and persistent pot, uh, pulmonary hypertension in the neonate. While these drugs can cause uh, premature closure of ductus arteriosus in the postnatal period, they may delay the closure of ductus arteriosus because prostaglandin has a role at both the stages, or keeping patency of the ductus arteriosus in the pregnancy and closure of the ductus arteriosus post-pregnancy. So being active, uh, being COX-2 inhibitors, COX inhibitors, these all NSAIDs have effect either prenatally or postnatally. Coming to opioids, morphine, uh, about morphine, there are no reports uh, which can have uh, the uh, teratogenic effects much in during the first trimester, but definitely the withdrawal symptoms, if the drug is decreased in dosages or uh, if there are altered pharmacokinetics, then the drug adjustment, dosage adjustment need to be done. And in the third trimester, again, to keep in mind the withdrawal signs in the neonate. Fentanyl is also said to be a safer drug in limited dosages and under observation. Regarding tramadol, it is said, or uh, the studies, there are not much studies about the uh, tramadol, but few of the papers mentioned that it is a weak, weak teratogenic and the neonate might, ha might have, uh, the chances of development of club foot are there uh, in patients who are taking tramadol. So again, guarded, uh, we can use tramadol. And towards the end of the pregnancy, in the third trimester, there might be respiratory depression and neonatal abstinence syndrome in the patients who are on the high dosages of tramadol. Uh, codeine, if the patient is, especially in the foreign countries, if the patient is on long term of treatment of codeine or high dosages, the chances of cleft palate and neonatal abstinence syndromes are more along with the respiratory depression uh, in the neonate. And to be kept into mind about the codeine regarding the genetic polymorphism, where the duplication of the cytochrome P enzyme may have increased metabolism of codeine and increased formation of the morphine, which may, be, uh, lead, to, which may lead to opioid toxicity. Regarding methadone, it has a favorable benefit risk-benefit ratio if it is used for opioid dependence maintenance program. But then again, the dose adjustment has to be done and your one has to keep into mind about the withdrawal symptoms. For the group of drugs in benzodiazepines, uh, again, the first trimester risk of cleft palate and lip are increased along with increased chances of spontaneous abortion. But more important than that, your one has to remember about the floppy infant syndrome towards the end of the trimester. And with the newborn with low ABGA score, muscular hypotonia, etc. About the tricyclic antidepressants and SSRI, what the literature mentions is if the patients are on TCAs and SSRI, they can continue with the drugs, but with caution and with proper counseling. Always keep in mind about the pregnant uh, pulmonary hypertension in the neonate and neonatal abstinence syndrome. 
What they mention most important is the discontinuing medication to avoid symptoms in the neonate may lead to relapse in the mother. So uh, instead of putting it down or completely uh, stopping the drug, we can adjust the dose and uh, it can be continued throughout the pregnancy. About the anti-epileptics, it is said that second generation are preferred and monotherapy is preferred rather than starting on two drugs. Amongst the carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine is preferred drug because there is low risk of teratogenicity as compared to other agents and it can be avoided or prevented with supplement of uh, folic acid along with it. There is limited data on pregabalin and gabapentin. There is no human trials or human data or case studies available much. So if, if it has to be continued only if the maternal benefit outweighs the fetal risk. Uh, All-time favorite drug, steroid, as Madam mentioned, it can be uh, in the lower minimal dosages can be continued throughout the pregnancy. And uh, it has to be kept in mind that preterm birth or congenital malformations could be there. If the patient is on sumatriptans for headache, the literature mentions that there is not any major risk associated in continuation of sumatriptans. But definitely the preeclampsia and preterm birth incidences increases with sumatriptan, which should be kept in mind. Again, beta blockers can be continued in low dosage throughout the pregnancy. But towards the end of the pregnancy, as Sukanya Madam uh, mentioned in her talk also, that uh, it, one has to keep into mind about the neonatal hypoglycemia, respiratory distress, and feeding problems if the pregnant lady is on beta blockers. But it is overall safe drug. The botulinum toxin is said to be relatively safe in pregnancy. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that it is better to avoid ASA and NSAIDs towards the end of the pregnancy especially. But acetaminophen is an acceptable drug throughout the pregnancy. Opioids, if patient is on opiate, could be continued with because they have associated low risk. Tramadol being weak, teratogenic, it is better to avoid anti-epileptics only if the benefit exceeds the risk. And triptans can be continued in the pregnancy. So specific and safe medications for pain management in pregnancy and lactation do not exist. We have uh, inadequate uh, data on that. Pain in pregnancy and lactation is not rare condition and must be recognized and carefully treated in a safe and effective way with multimodal approach and women and their health professionals should make an informed consent. Both the, part, uh, the physician and the woman should be at the same platform when they start the any analgesics and weigh up the potential risk of treating versus not treating pain during pregnancy and <coughs> breastfeeding. Yeah, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for making this complicated topic uh, simpler for us in summarizing all those drugs can be or cannot be given. So without wasting much time, I will move ahead. Uh, now we'll move ahead to the intervention part of pain management. I accordingly invite our next speaker, Dr. Uttam Sudhir, sir. Sir is a pain management consultant at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Jupiter Hospital, Pune. He's also honorary consultant at Bhatya Vidya Patan Medical College. Uh, he's a director of pain management clinic Pune. Uh, he has been GC member ISSP, past president secretary SSPP Pune, life member of ISSP and ISA. He has received pain ambassador award in ICRA Pain 2021. Invited as a faculty in various national international conferences, extensive work on SI joint pain. He has also pu has publication on clunial nerve cause for low back pain and fibromyalgia in Indian females. Welcome, sir. Uh, Hello. Yes. Can you uh, elaborate on the topic of interventions in pain, uh, yes. in pain pregnancy? Thank you, sir. So, should I my, share my screen? Yes, sir. You have yes, to share. sir. Yes, sir. Just a minute.
So can we can we see the screen? No. Uh, no, sir. Hello. So your screen is visible. You can share your PPT. Yeah. Okay. Can you see? So not the PPT. Hello. So you can sharing, see the Zoom window, sir. So you are sharing the desktop. Yeah. You unshare, need to open the first. Uh, unshare it. Unshare it, sir. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Go to the desktop where your PPT is there. Go to the desktop. No, the problem is the MacBook. It is showing. So, can you send uh, your PPT to? Um, I have I sent to my. Uh, uh, if you can yeah, send to me, I can it. share it. Sir. No, I have say I have shared it in Gmail with uh, Chobe, just a uh, few minutes back. Okay. note meanwhile can i ask a question dr uttam and dr varshali yes ma yes madam sure the magnesium sulfate used in a low dose has been identified to be a good pain alleviating uh, medicine given in dilution intravenously or maybe whenever you are giving spinal anesthesia or any regional uh, pain medicine is that so it helps in increasing the duration of action also and the depth of pain relief is that so with magnesium sulfate Yes, madam. Generally, for giving blocks, we are using magnesium as adjunct to the local anesthetics for uh, non-pregnant patients routinely, like fentanyl or any other new clonidine or dexmedetomidine. But in pregnant patient, we don't have any reports or literature providing that. But magnesium, either IV or as an adjunct to any of the block, definitely increases the threshold for pain or the duration of the analgesics. Yeah, because now in uh, obstetrics we are using magnesium sulfate for various mm -hmm. reasons, not only prevention of eclampsia and treatment, but also for tocolysis and yes. for neuroprotection of the babies. And even now there are quite a few studies which are saying that even in the HALLP syndrome, it causes a lot of stabilization of tissue destruction. So therefore, I was just wondering whether we can, you know, use it as a pain management medicine because. I think in the beginning, magnesium sulfate always went into disrepute because of its uh, low index of safety. Hello. Yes. Uh, can someone tell me how to share this thing on the uh, this is a MacBook this thing there? Sir, actually, it's difficult to share it on MacBook because I had experience that I had to switch it over to laptop. Sharing is sometimes not there in MacBook or notebook. Uh, uh, sir, can you can mail me? Let me yeah, also try. You can mail or. Uh, he has so already, already mailed, mailed to Rahul. The only thing is that it's, it's on the keynote. So I'm not even, I don't know whether. So can you can carry on can with we, the physiotherapy? Yeah, I, I was about to I ask. Can to we... the PP, PPT and then I will share. Okay, yes. sir. We'll move ahead now. 
So can we move ahead with next speaker? So after a discussion in pregnancy topic, we have uh, come to the other aspects of this webinar. So very important topic that uh, role of physiotherapy for chronic pain in pregnancy. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Swati Bissam, Madam, to deliver the lecture on this important topic. Uh, Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, Vivek's screen is again frozen. Yeah. Yes. Should I share? Is it visible? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, Swati Madam is a principal of School of Physiotherapy Bhatavid that is deemed to be University Pune. Uh, she has uh, she is an academician since 16 years in MUHS. She is also associated with uh, Maharashtra OTPT Council IAP IFMR. She has done PhD scholar at Dr. Deva Patel College of Physiotherapy Pune. Uh, she is a LIC member, UGPG examiner for MUHS and in universities. She has 16 publications in national and international journals. She has been guest speaker in webinar on virtual reality. She has received two awards for paper presentation at prestigious national and international conferences. Madam, I welcome you for this webinar. Uh, kindly enlighten us with the physiotherapy in chronic pain in pregnancy. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. Am I audible properly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, just one second. I will share my screen. Yes, your screen is visible, ma'am. You can go on yes. full, full screen mode. Yes. Is it fine now? Yes. It's yes. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you, Society for Study of Pain, Pune. Okay, in association with Bharti Hospital, I would like to say thanks to Dr. Madhuri Lokapure, ma'am, senior member and trustee of Society of Pain. Uh, I also would like to thank you, Dr. Sarita Swami, ma'am, president of SSPP and HOD of Bharti Hospital. Special mention to Dr. Vaishali Kenya, ma'am, uh, secretary SSPP. SSPP and Bharti Hospital and other office bearer. Vaishali ma'am is actually coordinating with me since long. Thank you so much. And uh, I really like to say thank you Dr. Girija ma'am and Dr. Sukanya ma'am who had actually started with the pain management and actually done uh, reduce my job. <laughs> okay. Just one sec. I will... Hmm. Is the paper visible properly? Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Now, role of physiotherapy plays an important role in chronic pain management in pregnancy. Actually, as we uh, heard, that the medication have a little bit limitation in pregnancy. Physiotherapy is generally concerned about the physical uh, dysfunction indirectly that are limiting to their uh, that are limiting to the functions. Pregnancy induced there are a lot of pathologies. I have just just uh, just a down a little bit a uh, uh, few of the things which causes uh, pain. First one is joint laxity. Second is mainly pelvic and sacroiliac dysfunction, coccidinia, abdominal weakness, nerve compression, varicose veins, stress incontinence, postural backache. That is one of the major concern. And second, last one is the breathing alternation. We'll go simultaneously one by one. First, uh, 
the <clears throat> changes majorly occurs from second trimester to the third trimester. Third trimester have a major postural changes has been already occurred. And after delivery, again, there is a quite variation in the postnatal stage. In early pregnancy and late pregnancy, we generally deal with the muscle function, right? Mainly, there is a changes occur in the uh, uh, there is a increase in weight in breast and uterus, right? And weakness in the abdominal muscles because the baby start growing and that indirectly, directly causing the uh, pressure on the nerves and which causes radiating type of pain. Then pelvic uh, indirectly because of hormonal changes and positional changes, there are the changes in the pelvic ligament and the joints. These are the one where first the, the changes occur in the abdominal as the abdominal muscles start weakening, right? Because and indirectly there is an effect on the spine that which causes increasing lordosis. And for that, there is a compensatory kyphotic changes in the thoracic spine and relatively again indirectly uh, changes, uh, the tertiary changes in the spine. Sir, compensatory tertiary changes in the cervical spine. As there is a weakness in the abdominal muscle and tightness in the anterior thigh muscle, it causes anterior pelvic tail and that indirectly causes a hip muscle weakness and posterior, posterior back muscle tightness. And uh, these postural changes have a directly or indirectly impact on the whole body, which causes if we start from the neck, the, there is a pain in the neck, indirectly it causes uh, irritation in the arm. And again, there is a CTS, carpal tunnel syndrome. There is a pain in the upper back egg, that is shoulders, pain, scapula are majorly discomfortable. And that may give a headache and again, tight shoulder and neck muscle. Then there is a, uh, because of abdominal muscle weakness, there is a low back pain, leg pain, pelvic pain, uh, symphysis, pubic, pubic dysfunction and pelvic girdle pain. Then again, related to changes occur in the lower extremities also because of overloaded joint, irritated cartilages. Okay, the knees goes in hyperextension and indirectly it causes knee pain and foot pain. There is also changes in the feet, that is drop arches, foot pain, plantar fasciitis, and risk of increase in shoe size. So first we'll start with the joint ligament laxity, that is majorly a risk factor. So any strenuous exercises has to be avoided. Light, stressful, less stressful uh, activities are recommended to the uh, sedentary, uh, sedentary females. Okay, like example, swimming, walking, biking, particularly, uh, particularly swimming is the one of the best mode of exercises. And again, if the uh, female is doing any aerobic type of exercises, then non wearing exercises is more preferable. Pelvic floor, pelvic floor muscle has a role in handling the internal organs as there is an increase in uterus okay indirectly it causes pressure on the pelvic floor muscle and that causes ligament that causes the muscle little bit becomes weak then because of hormonal changes there is a little bit uh, slightly uh, warm laxity occurs in the sacroiliac joint and again there is a in, uh, increase in gap in the pubic symphysis and these related changes are mainly to accommodate increase in size of the baby Sacroiliac pain could be individually occur or it can be associated with pubic symphysis pain that causes mainly tenderness on the palpation and it may radiate it to the groin and even medial thigh regions and majorly the pain is in weight bearing and most of the time uh, if if uh, suppose uh, like the, the females though who doesn't have means will we have to rule out for PID that means prolapse intervertebral disc most of the time it can be misunderstood that is SI joint pain can be misunderstood as a PID but that has to be clearly ruled out from orthopedician. Then <laughs> mainly 
the multiple biomechanical mechanisms which are responsible for the SI joint pain and pelvic dysfunctions, mainly increase in weight, change in posture, increase in abdominal and uterine pressure, laxity of spine and pelvic structure, and weakness in the floor and abdominal and hip extensor muscles. Physiotherapy have a major role, major role in uh, giving, uh, reducing the SI joint pain and even reducing the dysfunction. We majorly work on transverse abdominus muscle, that is one thing. Second thing, simultaneously we work for the stabilization, that is core muscle exercises, including transverse uh, abdominals, the external and internal obliques, hip extensor. These are the major postural muscles which help to give us stabilization during all activities. And sometimes the use of belt or corset is also recommended as a pelvic support. Then again, education related to the posture. And again, we do expect because few of the muscle goes in a tightness and few of the opposite side of the muscle goes in a weakness, stretch weakness. So those muscles which are already in a tightness, we have to give a little bit stretching type of exercises. And those muscles which have a weakness, we'll have to strengthen it. Then heat and ice statement is recommended massage slight massage is also recommended again high frequency medium frequency modalities are contraindicated for the spinal region in during pregnancy then positioning plays an important role while and sideline position in supine position the lumbar lordosis is a little bit increased so uh, knees are uh, sorry uh, under knees the pelvic uh, pillow is recommended and even in sideline position because the upper thigh goes in adduction and that may cause a si joint pain more so maintaining the symmetry of the um, body the uh, pillows are uh, pillows can be kept under, under the uh, leg between the leg to maintain the leg in a straight position. And sometimes we do give a SI stretching exercises that is mainly for the mobility. And these are the one of the corset which can be recommended. Then coccidinia, that is pain in tailbone, mainly the pillow for sitting is recommended. Then strengthening of pelvis muscle and again strengthening and stretching of the exercises around the pelvis and SI joint is uh, uh, recommended. And even sometime relaxation with the breathing exercises will be helpful for reducing the pain. Role of abdominal plays an important role in anyone's life. Okay, it el it helps in uh, the helps in many body functions like urinating, defecating, coughing, sneezing, breathing, phonation, and uh, even singing. Increase in abdominal pressure facilitate also facilitate in childbirth birth protect the internal organ and also it helps to maintain the posture and it indirectly helps to give a provide a core support the support to the spine and body during all transition movement are uh, uh, are recommended that is through uh, through recruitment of the transfer abdominal muscle and external and internal oblique muscles then what are the changes that majorly what we uh, what i have already explained you majorly there is a first there is an increase in lumbar lordosis there is a related hyperkurosis at the thoracic spine and that hyperkurosis indirectly causes protraction of the shoulder and also causes anterior angulation of the cervical region then there is a hipness in, uh, weakness in the hip region and the uh, the female can walk as a uh, changes in the posture that is called as waddling gait pattern can be seen. Exercises from first, second, and even early third trimester. Okay, we can recommend it for a few exercises. Like example, this is a quadruped position with the hip extensor and scapular muscle uh, activation, and including the abdominal muscles are anti gravity. Uh, uh, against anti-gravity is getting activated. Then bridging exercises and spinal stretching exercises. We do ask the patient to uh, few ergon give ergonomic advices related to the posture. During a standing position, even in sitting position and in other position, we do ask them to recruit the transfer abdominal muscle so that the load on the spine will be reduced and little bit 
uh, the posture is corrected these are the few different position where the transverse abdominal muscle is recruited it is mainly to give pelvic tilting exercises that is posterior pelvic tilting exercises are recommended in all positions then nerve compression thora uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the common uh, uh, pains generally seen and even in lower extremity the radiating uh, type of pain is expected due to weight of the uterus fluid retention hormonal changes and circulatory compromise so first we do give a stretching exercises then also strengthening exercises to the muscle which are weak we majorly work for the symmetrical body posture okay some manual techniques that is mfr massage can be given to relax the muscles and uh, reduce the tightness of the muscle ergonomic assessment has to be needed because few females can be working and few females have a sedentary lifestyle depend on that the treatment protocol has to be uh, managed then modalities like tens icing and hot pack can be given to reduce the tingling type of pain and nerve irritation pains and sometimes splints can be recommended varicose vein are preferable ankle toe movement is recommended elevation of the limb with compression and burgess exercises are advisable then trace incontinence is due to pelvic floor muscle weakness also abdominal muscle weakness so that's why the intervention is will have to give a transverse transverse advance uh, transverse abdominus muscle strengthening then the external and internal uh, muscle strengthening then pelvic floor muscle exercises including kegel exercises and with abdominals relatively back extensors and hip extensors muscle has to be recruited means strengthened posture back ache that is generally due to stress weakness asymmetry hormonal changes and weight of the baby so we do give a jacobs and relax relaxation technique that helps in uh, relaxation of the whole muscle all body muscle right and that relaxation can be advisable with the breathing exercises positioning in all position like supine position side line position sitting position standing position in all position we give a advice so that the lordosis has to be a uh, little bit reduced okay lordosis can be flattened and load on the abdominals and back extensor can be reduced and the muscle other postural muscle that can be indirectly get activated in that particular position so ergonomic advice plays an important role for uh, for postural back ache then uh, in the last uh, trimester of the pregnancy growing baby pushes the uterus against the diaphragm the diaphragm is move up around 4 cm so automatically the lungs get compressed and the ribs are little bit uh, laterally flared up so intervention is relaxation with the deep exercises and mainly positioning okay and then diaphragmatic breathing we do uh, give strengthening to the diaphragmatic muscle and thoracic expansion exercises are uh, recommended ergonomic care that is daily activities has to be uh, made changes that is one thing asymmetrical poses has to be avoided right symmetrical position in all position will be uh, recommended then single leg weight bearing excessive abduction and uh, excessive abduction and sitting on very soft surfaces has to be avoided and generally we do advise them to activate all core muscle in all positions sitting standing and even uh, a female, uh, even the lady who is on working then post delivery uh, post delivery, delivery there is a chances of pneumonia then we do teach them the coughing and huffing techniques then uh, majorly with the breathing exercises then post surgical pain can be reduced by supporting the suture side and uh, majorly we do work on the abdominal weakness that is diastasia recta and uh, will help in reducing the adhesion formation at the incision side diastasia recta is one of the common condition we generally seen in all pregnant ladies uh, any 
deviation larger than 2 cm is uh, known as significant. So these are the few glimpses of the diastasia recta and sometimes the diastasia recta can have a more stretch mark and sometimes that is really an awkward situation for the female also. So that can be reduced when we start the exercises at the first trimester and second trimester again while starting with any exercises first trimester second semester and third semester okay absolute contraindication and relative contraindication has to be checked out the intervention for diastasia recta is mainly a transfer abdominal muscle exercises oblique strengthening right and crunches uh, pelvic bridging and there is a combination of more lower limb exercises for the diastasia recta correction then mainly for the scar, that is caesarean scar, uh, physiotherapy again plays an important role because we do give a scar mobilization. So indirectly, directly, we are helping to reduce the adherency of the scar to the underlying structure. The friction massage and kneading can be recommended, okay, and including the lower abdominal muscle strengthening so that the muscle will be mobile in that particular area and that will help to loosen the scar. And sometime after the delivery, the ultrasound can be used to uh, reduce the adherency of the scar. These are the few exercises that is pelvic tilting exercises. Uh, positioning that is hip abductor strengthening, then collapse, then diagonal collapse, then bridging, and then upper extremity exercises, and even planks. Plank are the best exercises which activate the extensor muscles also, and even the flexor muscles also. Then stretching and strengthening exercises include lower abdo abdominals, upper abdo abdominals, hip extensor strengthening, and even sometimes the pyrophormis stretching is, uh, plays a huge role in reducing the pain. Then uh, pelvic floor muscle, that is including wall spot. So these are the different exercises we do recommend or uh, we do prescribe to the patient. With the exercise, ergonomic care is important. That is maintaining position in all ADLs, like example, baby feeding. Then again, avoid uh, baby, baby feeding has to be, the baby has to be supported on the pillow. Avoid any direct jerky movement from the spine. Try to bend from the knee so that the strain on the spine will be avoided. And again, whenever the lady is carrying or female is carrying the baby, make sure that we just ask her to carry the baby in a symmetrical posture so that indirectly the asymmetry will be avoided. So these are the uh, few physiotherapy uh, advices. So with this, I would like to thank you and thank you for giving me opportunity to present. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving us overview on physiotherapy and different exercises. Now, I would like to again invite Dr. Uttam, sir, for uh, his talk on intervention pain management in pain in chronic, uh, chronic pain in pregnancy. Over to you, sir. So you're muted. So we can see the slides. So uh, please unmute yourself.
the slides are being shared sir uh, you can continue you... sir please unmute 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 karav lagel sir unmute kare yes sir hello you are audible uttam you can go ahead okay thank you very much so by god grace uh, this is the last thing and uh, the by the sequence the, now i am in the last so good evening everyone uh, first of all i thank don't SSPT worry we are awake <laughs> no but the, the intervention should be the last thing in the pregnancy though fortunately the sequence is now uh, uh, appropriate so thank you everyone thank you sspp and glad to meet dr girija madam i started my initial practice with her uh, my topic in a sense it is simple and as well as it's a little complicated also so when we are talking about the intervention in pregnancy uh, next slide please it's a very difficult task when patient comes with uh, with pain and uh, she is not responding to any conservative management then 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 there are lot of things in our mind what to do up next how to give her pain relief so there are so many hurdles in treatment of uh, this pain management for the uh, for the lady uh, pregnant lady so there are pharma pharmacological challenges you have covered that thing even imaging challenges when we are use we are used to fluoroscopy and uh, that way we are not uh, we were not used to ultrasound initially so that was a big challenge and even uh, when we are thinking about the giving position because most of the patient comes with the back pain and most of the time we we are uh, we are trained in the prone position doing procedures in prone prone position so positional challenges are very much when we are dealing with the uh, this pregnant patient next so you all have covered all this thing what are the reasons of pre existing pain can exacerbate like uh, rheumatoid arthritis even the migraine even the fibromyalgia can exacerbate in the uh, in pregnancy there are non non obstetric pain arising from the pregnancy or pre existing pain exacerbated by the pregnancy by uh, this is because of the changes in the maternal anatomy as well as physiology and changes in the posture uh, all you have covered everything uh, in detail so that is because of the gravity of the uterus uh, gravid uterus and as well as the joint laxity and pelvic tilt so uh, because of that you get a pain even the stretching of the uh, spreading of the symphysis pubis can give rise to pelvic pain si joint immobility can cause pelvic pain even the pelvic tilt can cause gives the extensor abductor and ankle plantar flexions uh, uh, increase use of these muscles next so in swedish study uh, there are there are a lot of studies uh, about the back pain in pregnancy so uh, almost 76% reported back pain uh, during the time of pregnancy uh, the range varies from 16% to 76% the good thing for us fortunately the vertebral disc pain is one in 10000 so that is a uh, sometimes the patient come with a uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, herniated disc and that pain is very excruciating but the incidence is very low in that thing so uh, uh, previous uh, next slide next slide so uh, the problem in treating with this uh, pregnant patient is that we don't have much data available there are no no randomized control trials uh, whether the we should go for the intervention or we should wait for the uh, for any procedure so there is no a randomized control trial and there are there are no guidelines as such to how to treat the uh, uh, the pregnant pain chronic pain in pregnancy so most commonly used treatment is either physiotherapy water gymnastic hydrotherapy even the acupuncture uh, puncture sometimes helps pharmacological management and rarely intervention or surgery in that sense so what are the common obstetric problem which may need intervention is that nerve entrapment that is very common uh, this is because of stretching of the abdominal wall causing the entrapment syndrome so nerve which are piercing through the uh, rectus abdominis muscle can cause traction and entrapment of this muscle uh, these nerves and can cause unilateral pain below the umbilicus so if you are getting such kind of pain in any pregnant patient you can give local anesthetic and steroid because steroid 
the uh, the gynecologist uh, obstetricians are also giving steroid for the uh, for the pregnant patient so there is no harm in giving local anesthetic and steroid of a single shot in such kind of uh, uh, nerve entrapment even there are, the people have seen the iliogastric and genitofemoral or lateral cutaneous nerve entrapment in those cases also local anesthetic and steroid under uhg guidance can produce reduce this pain carpal tunnel syndrome there was no evidence available for any intervention for the car carpal tunnel syndrome only the elevation of the limb because it uh, it is because of the fluid retention and fat deposit so elevation of, of the limb and splint that is the only thing we can do no rule of intervention in the carpal tunnel syndrome oxidinia is when one of the major uh, reason for the patient come to you for the chronic pain in pregnancy so oxidinia can exas exacerbate during the pregnancy as well as after the delivery so 60% of the patient response to local infiltration with local anesthetic and steroid even the heat pack and ring cushion may be effective headache tension type headache and migraine uh, is the commonest form which we can see in a pregnant patient uh, when we are diagnosing uh, the headache as a migraine or tension type headache please exclude preeclampsia and subarachnoid hemorrhage in these patients so trigger point injection may be helpful in tension type headache and my uh, migraine because botulinum toxin you can use uh, sometimes in the in pregnancy so you can try that thing if the patient is uh, with a refractory migraine there are some neuralgic pain pre existing trigeminal neuralgia or glossopharyngeal neuralgia can may exacerbate i have uh, come across with one glossopharyngeal neuralgia patient uh, in in pregnancy that uh, pain exacerbate so i did uh, uh, one procedure for her so uhg guided peripheral nerve blocks you can try in the, uh, this thing if the patient is not responding to simple medication prefer investigation in all these things in back pain as well as in neuralgic or trigeminal neuralgia or glossopharyngeal in neuralgia is mri so in um, to rule out all other uh, causes of back pain like uh, herniated disc or any fracture uh, uh, mri is the best uh, investigation available the conservative management is a choice of treatment in uh, there is no if there is no weakness otherwise uh, uh, and bed rest is in the supine position with raised uh, feet and fle uh, flexion of the hip physical therapy tens is uh, have shown uh, have given uh, good results in uh, back pain uh, reduce physical activity and i asked uh, females it is a little scary to tell a female to low uh, low heel shoes nowadays but that is a treatment for uh, avoiding the back pain so intervention if in back pain if pain is not responding to conservative management then the intervention can be you can give a thought of it the problem faced during the intervention is imaging technique because uh, we are used for the fluoroscopy and uh, using the ultrasound for the lumbar uh, lumbar uh, intervention is not advisable so uh, that is one problem when we are facing uh, uh, when we are doing intervention in pregnancy even the position positioning of the patient if the patient in first trimester trimester you can go ahead with the prone position but if the patient is in second or third trimester then positioning is also a problem epidural steroid uh, there is no data as such available or uh, the what uh, whether we should go or avoid with the epidural steroid but it can be considered in during the th second and third trimester prone position is possible in first trimester lateral position is preferred in second and third trimester i think dr varshali did one uh, caudal epidural recently in the bharti for the pregnant patient in the lateral position so uhg is the only imaging available for any intervention in pregnancy even though radiological exposure for most diagnostic procedure do not involve fetal exposure about 0.05 gaia so use of epidural steroid during pregnancy is controversial no guidelines are established addressing the use of corticosteroids in pregnancy while using uh, uhg advisable to use doppler uh, uh, uhg imaging better to confirm the intravascular though it is not sure the whether we are intravascular even if we are using doppler but it is advisable to use doppler when whenever you are using uhg so this is a uh, relton hall frame which uh, the the uh, the surgeons have used uh, to uh, do a surgery for the pregnant patient so this is a relton hall frame uh, which uh, in the second or third trimester you can use that thing uh, and there are some reports about the surgery also surgery when the patient is pregnant uh, because of the herniated disc so next slide there are few publications available for surgical intervention in case of cauda equina 
and there are uh, there are two or three papers about the korean surgeon performing endoscopic surgery for herniated disc during the pregnancy that is kim et al and hayakawa et al data is very limited about the surgical intervention or endoscopic intervention in uh, pre pregnancy if the patient is coming with the herniated disc so no, no such data available for the use of fluoroscopy in pain procedures but few papers are available about the fluoroscopy in ercp so they have done ercp using uh, the fluoroscopy but the mean fluoroscopy time was about 14 seconds range from 1 to 48 seconds depending upon the the time taken for the ercp and estimated fetal radiation exposure was 40 mrad uh, there was correlation between fluoroscopy time and the radiation exposure so two so they follow up that those females and two women developed third trimester pre uh, third and uh, third trimester preeclampsia and labor was induced in both and 13 out of 15 patient who delivered were contacted and they were confirmed they confirmed that their child was in good health so they have but there is no data available as such use of fluoroscopy in pain management in my experience what is my experience about treating pregnant chronic pain patient having pregnancy the i treated one glossopharyngeal nerve block i did pulse radio frequency ablation because i thought Uh, uh there is no harm using pulse radio frequency ablation i did use a blind technique because i was not comfortable using uh, uh, ultrasound for the glossopharyngeal the patient was in uh, was in third trimester uh, the everything pregnancy event uh, went uneventful and she delivered full term baby without any complication uh, i did uh, i, I didn't uh, but the department of bharti department pain department they did caudal epidural for the disc pain uneventful uh, till now and uh, i did one trigger point injection for my facial and tension type headache uh, which was uneventful so this was my experience about treating chronic pain in pregnancy so what what is the take home message for uh, everyone is that conservative management is the best thing to do when patient is coming with the chronic pain and she is pregnant so local anesthetic steroid uh, no uh, should not be uh, no, under fluoroscopy should not be tried uh, you should not use you should always use ultrasound if possible or sometimes you can uh, without ultrasound also sometimes if it is safe to use because i have used a blind uh, blind technique uh, so but there is no data have as such available to use all these things so rarely surgical intervention with cauda equina and motor weakness so this is a uh, take home message for uh, thank you very much thank you sir sir i would like to ask one question in pregnant females you yeah, as you said local anesthesia uh, infiltration with steroid so what do you prefer without steroid also it might have good effect for so but, uh, as the, the, the even the gynecologists are using uh, obstetricians are using steroid for the lung maturity so there is no no harm in using that steroid for for this okay. patient but data is still inadequate to in there, there is no such data available and no guidelines available for use non using not using steroid or whether we should use steroid in steroid you prefer like exa only or anything no i i use the uh, depomedrol in my okay. patient Yeah, I would like to share our experience. Uh, as you said, caudal epidural was given in a pregnant lady. Yeah, uh, few things about that. The we did caudal epidural under sonography, but the position was lateral and it was too difficult to visualize the caudal space as compared to what we are used to in prone position in normal patient. Maybe because of the edema, thickened tissues. lateral space everything was very difficult what i experienced this case was done at jahangir along with lokapur madam it was madam's case and there we tried under sonography but it was very difficult very uh, with lot of difficulty would we could visualize the tip of the needle but not as good as what we used to in prone position and non pregnant patient and regarding the drugs we gave local anesthetics along with uh, Uh, steroid but definitely not a uh, particular steroid we preferred giving dexamethasone non particulate steroid the patient had uh, extrusion of disc with severe pain she had been tried on conservative management with medications but with no relief so at the last resort we madam uh, decided to go ahead with caudal epidural Uh, so it was uh, 
look up with madam's uh, case and she uh, decided to go ahead with the uh, caudal epidural and it did give a good pain relief to the patient yes uh, actually the feedback is that patient has been absolutely pain free and um, frankly speaking i am not too convinced with this usg guidance yeah <laughs> but at the end of the day i kept telling varshali yes this is loss of resistance <laughs> this is what i would trust <laughs> and finally that that's what we did so but fortunately varshali could also show some kind of uh, fluid presence while i threaded the catheter in so i guess both of us were happy but uh, yeah it was difficult but the oh, yeah. take home message is that one i agree with uttam because now we have got lot of data with corona patients i know at least three or four patients whom i have seen who received very high doses of steroids because of their corona status and who had absolutely normal babies so i don't think steroids should hold you back secondly you need to give them steroids because you don't want a short term effect you want something much longer lasting and you can't keep doing the procedures in these patients so i agree that uh, steroids should be used in the doses which we are using and secondly try to use intervention over giving nsaids especially in the third trimester because not just closure of the pda but also uh, the lung uh, sorry the kidney function and everything gets affected for the baby so much much better to do the intervention where it is possible uh, may i ask one question ma'am actually sure. ma'am lokapur ma'am uh, if this case wouldn't have been possible with usg guided caudal and as she mentioned patient had intractable pain so was this patient could have been taken for surgery obviously we can't do fluoroscopic intervention so oh you can do fluoroscopy you see i checked with the radiologist what okay. they say is organogenesis happens um, i'm sure dr girija can correct me it happens in the first trimester so by putting this patient under fluoroscope for 5 6 exposures would not have mattered okay. but of course i mean we got a got away without it but yes Oh, yeah. uh, in these situations you can use fluoroscopy but then in lateral position it will be again a difficult task i mean you will have to adjust the fluoroscope in such a way yeah uh, can i speak yes yeah, sukanya uh, ma'am any difference hi sukanya yeah. <laughs> yeah uh -huh. just want to a point for dr sigal when he was speaking like i think that nowadays particulate uh, steroids are not um you know um, advised because and especially this is lot of medical legal implication so what madhuri you did is probably the best thing that is use of dexamethasone along with local anesthetic and that should be the method of choice if at all given and um, uh, to answer the question like if you can't locate with ultrasound but like when we do both ultrasound and caudal under fluoroscope like we do see that uh, definitely fluoroscope is much better like uh, but uh, um, having said that like if at all you can't do you can still do a blind technique as well because for years on like you know people were doing and caudal is pretty simple uh, procedure <clears throat> and, and um, the effect is good in pregnant patients and um, one more thing is that dexamethasone we have used dexamethasone uh, in co conjunction with local anesthetic for labor analgesia and uh, single dose dexamethasone should not be a problem although like um, you know huge heavy dose is not warranted in this kind of patients thank you any questions dr shweta can you check in the chat box uh, there are no questions on chat box actually i check the youtube link also okay so shall we move ahead okay yeah thank you it was a very uh, brainstorming session right from the prevalence to the interventions in pregnancy so i'm sure that we all have uh, gained some knowledge and will go ahead in our practice with this so now in the last i would like to hand over this session uh, to dr joshankar jana sir 
for the vote of thanks. I thank all the speakers for joining us in this session and uh, would like to have you later for more uh, seminars like this. Thank you all. Good night. Over to you, Jana sir. Dr. Jana, unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, unmuted myself. Yeah, on behalf of the uh, Society of Study of Pain, Pune City, I uh, uh, give the vote of thanks on behalf of our president, Dr. Sarita Swami, and the con complete executive committee of uh, SSPP. Uh, first, I'll give a vote of thanks to all our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Girija Vag, my old dear friend, Dr. Sukanya. Bardidi, thank you so much <laughs> for coming and sharing your thoughts with you. And uh, Dr. Swati Pise, madam, uh, who gave a fantastic lecture, a very uh, different insight to the physiotherapy and the physiotherapy during pain and pregnancy. And to our local speakers, of course, starting with Dr. Uttam, Dr. Varshali, and uh, uh, who else is there? I have everybody. And uh, on and also, huh? have I missed anybody? No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so uh, I also thank our anchor, Dr. Shweta, and uh, Dr. Vivek, who has been instrumental in doing, organizing and collecting all the data and all, and of course Varsha Kurade, over enthusiastic and. <laughs> Fantastic as ever. And overall, uh, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Madhuri uh, Lokapur, we had a very fantastic webinar. Uh, to the evening. I hope everybody has enjoyed. Of course, uh, Uttam has finally given the bottom line of interventions in pain management. In and uh, uh, let's uh, call it a day. It's already uh, more than uh, 9.45, 9.50. So thank you all uh, for joining us. We'll uh, wait till we meet in person again. Of course, we'll be meeting when we meet in Bhopaneshwar in person. Till then, cheers to all and long live SMP. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.